So hi, this is uh, Steve Call from the New America Foundation and uh, the New Yorker magazine, and I'm glad to be here with Michael Gravel. I think we're a couple of um, misguided journalists, small in number, who are devoting themselves in one way or another to the stimulus bill. And uh, Michael's reminded me that it's been exactly two months since the president signed it. And uh, I think maybe we should just uh, start by exchanging I, exchanging descriptions of what we're doing, Michael, since I, I follow what you've been doing a little bit on ProPublica, but what's your sort of theory of the case? What are you, what are you uh, how are you proceeding and what are you trying to examine as the stimulus spending rolls out? Well, it's interesting because you and I are kind of taking two different approaches to it. Um, I'm really I'm kind of looking at how is the money being spent, uh, where are the pitfalls that exist with programs that are all of a sudden are getting large amounts of money um, and maybe haven't had great records in the past of, of spending it. Um, I'm also starting to look at now that the money is going out, where is it going? Is it going to the right projects? Yeah, yeah. So that that's that's useful and and only kind of shoe leather uh, reporting that's rooted in some experience of the government programs probably could make that work. What have you found so far? Uh, well, it's interesting. We're, we looked uh, earlier this week at the rural broadband service. Uh, rural broadband service is this – or sorry, the rural utility service is this agency that's going to be managing $2.5 billion worth of, uh, you know, the stimulus money to bring Internet service to the heartland. Um, and it, it – it, we'll talk more about it later in the program, but the um, you know they've had some issues in the past with how they've spent their money. Uh, I think uh, the the inspector general said that about a you know they've had irregularities with about a quarter of the money in the first four years of the program, um, and about that about ninety percent of the cities that have been wired with with the money are, with the loans that they give out are already had broadband service. Right. And I, I remember reading this because what I've been doing, as you know, is I for, on my blog at the New Yorker, NewYorker.com. I, I just have been reading the stimulus bill cold, uh, inspired by the way uh, David Plotz read the Bible cold a couple of years ago. And occasionally I'll try. So to... So what have you divined? Well, but let me ask you. But just a minute, just I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, I'll I'll try to answer that. But let me just uh, ask you about this broadband thing because I remember reading that section and. First of all, being surprised that the stimulus provisions for broadband infrastructure, which are often highlighted because they sound so next economy and sort of wave of the future, uh, kind of international highway system for the uh, for the next generation economy, that uh, a big chunk of it was actually to be administered by the Department of Agriculture, and that I think is the rural broadband program that you're referring to. And what I remember is that the Secretary of Agriculture was required to come back to House Appropriations within X days, was it 90 days, with some plan that would theoretically avoid all of the um, pitfalls that have been documented in the past. It, it, do you know where that stands and what they're going to do to try to uh, address the overlap between this new spending and the existing commercial markets out there? Um, you know, I don't know for sure. I, um, I know right now none of the loans have been given out. Uh, none of the grants have been given out. Uh, there's very little that has been put out about how they're going to administer and address some of these problems. Yeah, my, my, my impression was that they maybe they couldn't even make the loans or the grants until they reported to the House Appropriations Committee about what they were going to do. But uh, there's, right. a, there's a, you know one of the things that strikes you. I mean, I'm now reading. I've been reading just from the beginning forward and and blogging as I go along uh, when I. To come across something that seems either interesting or important or entertaining. There's actually more entertainment in it than I thought, but uh, I guess you have to be of a certain mind. But the, one of the things that's striking is that in many cases where you are clearly dealing with a complicated problem of the sort you just referred to with rural broadband, where, for instance, you're pumping a whole lot of money into a federal agency that may not have a great track record or may not have the capacity to think through how to deploy it uh, well, that th there's a kind of pattern of punting in the legislation where they, they say, well, uh, the secretary or so-and-so will come back to us in 90 days and, t and tell us how they're going to do this. And until then, they have to sit on their hands. So there's going to be a flood of reporting, in other words, from the executive to the Congress 
over the next uh, month or so that may be more important than um, even the framing legislation was in the beginning. Right, and we've seen, um, you know, some of the reporting so far has been a little bit lacking in terms of the public, you know, accessibility of it. Uh, you know, you sort of talk about how you've been dissecting the bill. Some of these weekly reports that have been created solely for the purpose so that the public can understand how the money is being spent are being written with these obscure Treasury accounting symbols. Uh, for example, one and, and description. So one description is NTIA DTAC BP or something like that. Well, when you break that down, that's the National Telecommunications and Information Administration Digital to Analog Converter Box Program. <laughs> and that's basically um, that's your TV for box. people who have older TV right. sets to right. give them uh, a coupon so that they can switch their TV to digital uh, so that when they make this conversion that has been talked about uh, for several you know several years now, if, uh, that they won't see their TVs go white yeah. or yeah. go blank. Well, this whole this whole goal of transparency, uh, you know, is is uh, proving pretty pretty elusive across the policy responses to the economic crisis. And certainly, reading the bill, um, if you wanted to really stop uh, at any just about any paragraph within the agency provisions and be able to, you know, sort of accurately describe from a standing start, which is where I am, you know, cold start. I know the federal bureaucracy. Sometimes I come across things I've covered before. Sometimes they're new. But in order to examine, I mean, just to explain what the stimulus spending is for, uh, usually requires, in my experience, you know, two to three hours of work just using government documents because everything is interconnected and there's lots of abbreviations, as you say, and there's lots of cross-references to previous legislation because it's often under the authority of past laws that the new right. spending is being directed. And then you have to go back and figure out what the past laws were and how they've been amended. It's complicated. Tell, tell me about one that you wrote about um, on, the, on the blog, I think a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, that... You know, the language is basically provided that no portion of such funds shall be reserved to carry out sections 127B1A of the Workforce Investment Act of 1998. Right. What is that? Well, so it was an example of this problem, and I just sort of stopped at it and thought, well, um, why? And uh, why would you have an ex such a specific exception? And uh, so then it requires going and finding the Workforce Investment Act of 1998 and then finding this section and you discover there that there were um, job training program provisions in that bill that had triggers in them if in any fiscal year the amount allocated was in excess, I think, of a billion dollars was the threshold. And then all sorts of things happened that they didn't want to happen, so they just sort of exempted that section of the bill. But then it turned out that in that section of the bill there were also strange provisions earmark-like provisions that had directed money to, uh, like, military schools to be set up on old military bases. You just end up going down a rabbit trail, and uh, you would imagine that from, you know, the, the, the what's interesting about this from a, I guess, from a citizen's or a taxpayer's point of view is that it's an important claim of the Obama administration that they're really going to police this, but, and the vice president, you know, Sheriff Joe Biden is going to do that, but it would take a substantial amount of dedicated staff, it seems to me, to to, to really thoroughly vet this uh, from from all of these different angles. And I'm not sure quite how they intend to do that, other than through the inspector general process. Yeah, they've. When we broke down the bill uh, on our website, we've broken down you know a detailed list of spending, where you can just look in a chart and see how. Each thing is done. We added up the oversight provisions. It's about $350 million that's being spent. And they've created this, um, as you know, they've created this Recovery and Accountability Transparency Board, uh, which everyone's calling the, the RAT Board, right? Um, and they put in charge uh, Earl Devaney, who's got this legendary status, it seems, with, uh, you know, the Jack Abramoff scandal. And, uh, you know, I read one story that he had caught someone with, um, you know, caught someone taking a bribe with a camera that was stuffed into a shellacked alligator's head. 
Uh, so it was almost like when he, when he came in, he seemed to calm a lot of fear. It was almost like someone had cued the theme to the good, the bad, and the ugly, and everyone sort of lost their breath and was like, wow, Earl Devaney, um, he's going to address some of these issues. So beforehand, uh, Senator Grassley had a lot of concerns about the independence of inspectors general, and I spoke to his staff uh, after Devaney was named, and it seemed to have been calmed a little bit. Hmm. That's interesting. You know, I mean, it does take you into this more sort of um, – philosophical realm, which at least I have the luxury of being in, since unlike you, I'm not actually out doing any shoe leather reporting on the whole about this. I do lots of shoe leather reporting about other things. But, uh, you know, it, it sort of goes to the question of what really, how should we measure the stimulus? I mean, what are its sources of effectiveness? And I think there, and, and what are the ways in which ultimately in five years or so, you might begin to look back and judge whether they did a good job or they didn't. And I think you know, there's there's lots of interrelated answers to that, but there's several maybe I just kind of toss back at you. One is the level that you're describing, which is how much fraud and abuse is actually created by the shot in the arm spending, and and how effective as a proportion of the spending are the auditors and the inspectors general and the others in identifying that fraud and abuse. Uh, because we saw in the Iraq War, for example, in the contracting system, right. you know, you throw a lot of money, uh, especially if you bundle it up in pallets of cash and put it on the plane, and you know, a fair amount of it uh, goes away. And uh, so, so that's that's one important level. But, you know, there are others too, which is like the the more sort of which go to the origin of the bill. Which how is, many jobs are going to be created? Yeah, right? how many jobs are going to be created, and how long are they going to last? And and then there's an even additional promise beyond just creating jobs, which is not only are we going to create jobs, but we're going to change the character of the of the economy. We're going to make a down payment on transformation in a big way. And right. so, you know, is, is that really going to happen? Um, you know, that's interesting, especially from, you know, the the transportation point of view. Um, there's, you know, I think it was yesterday that President announced his high-speed rail plan, and, and there is a large chunk that was put in uh, on, the, you know, on the eve of signing of the bill, the last minute, this $8 billion fund for high-speed rail corridors. Uh, these are the corridors between New York and Washington, between, you know, St. Louis and Chicago and Milwaukee, California and San Francisco. And, um, you know, We've never had, you know, a large uh, high-speed rail plan, uh, you know, st strategic plan in this country. So just getting started, I think some of these plans are, um, you know, I think California was saying it's going to cost $40 billion for them to do it. Right. And at the very best, they hope they can get about $2 billion from the stimulus plan. Right. Uh, so you're talking, you know, what, 20 stimulus plans to, <laughs> to get that working. So right. how, you know how much of a down payment is it uh, and, and how transformative is it going to be, I think, is a big question. Yeah, exactly. And, it, I mean, there, there are down payments. That's what they've been described as. But in some cases, they're pretty small. High-speed rail is a good example of that. In each case, I think the answer is different. Each, in each case, it's pretty interesting. In, in no case that I've come across yet is the investment contained in the stimulus itself transformational. But in some cases, it is jump-starting something that, that might be if it were followed through right. by other policies. So two examples of that are, I think, in uh, the energy field and in uh, the healthcare field. And here, there's a there's a much more explicit way in which the stimulus is a down payment. So because the stimulus is meant to be a precursor to subsequent legislation, big reform legislation in the case of energy cap and trade, in the case of healthcare, a healthcare reform bill. Now, if neither of those big follow-on bills passes, then the down payment may turn out to be a waste because it may just trickle into a, a sort of a culvert that, that doesn't connect to anything. Uh, so anyway, in the case of energy, the down payment is to change, start to change the electricity grid so that it can receive renewable energy in, in greater amounts. Uh, you know, that might otherwise be stranded from the customers. So, you know, solar in the Southwest reaching customers in cities elsewhere and so on. And in the case of healthcare, it's making perhaps investments that are less risky because they're going to be necessary whether or not you get a healthcare reform bill, such as uh, building information systems so that your doctor, you don't have to carry your x rays from doctor to doctor, that they're kind of piped together 
as you'd think they would be in the digital age that we live in. Right, and another place where there's been a lot of talk about transformation is in education. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, um, you know, they've talked, they've put a lot of money into this, and, and in every speech it seems like the president has said building the schools, of, schools and the classrooms of the future so that, uh, you know, our kids in 20 years from now can compete for those jobs, you know, green jobs and those jobs of the new economy. Um, I went out and did some reporting in Elkhart a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, Elkhart is where President Obama sort of launched the stimulus package. Uh, He went and spoke there in early February just as this bill was being passed, Uh, and Elkhart has seen their unemployment go from about 6% last year at this time to about 20% uh, in most recent numbers in February. Um, So I went out there and talked to the school business manager, and he, you know, had a different perspective on this. He was saying, you know, the money runs out in two years, so... Uh, if I build a new school, you know, my uh, uh, enrollment is declining. Uh, what am I going to do with the new school building? If I build the classroom of the future with all this great technology, in two years, what if I don't have the money to maintain it uh, or to fix the computers? Uh, if I hire a whole bunch of new teachers and the money runs out, you know, are we going to have to have just lay them all off now? Um, so I think that's a big question that's going on all across, you know, uh, America right now, and it it, it the, the reality on the ground seems to be, you know, differing a bit from what you hear in the speeches. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the education is, I, I'm still kind of reading through the education parts myself and trying to figure out where the investments are located in the bill, because as, as in the other big transformational subjects, they're kind of spread around in different places. But my overall impression is that, uh, there are, first of all, the investments on the education side are side are large compared to either healthcare or energy, which are themselves, you know, not small, but they're, they're really big. And that most of the, or at least half, maybe more than half, I haven't quite figured it out, of the education investments are really just short, are they're intended as short-term transfers to the states to prevent layoffs and crises in the many states that have seen their tax revenue collapse. And, you know, of course, uh, education in this country is funded from local tax bases, often from property taxes, which is one of the reasons we have such a kind of an unequal education system. And with tax revenues falling in every direction at the state and local level, so there's a big chunk of money, I think it's like 50 billion or ish, um, <laughs> no, that's not the way we talk about 50 billion anymore, uh, that, that is just uh, pure transfer. At least you're not getting your billions and millions of years. <laughs> right. And, but then there's then there then there are these other kind of down payment pieces that are meant to be transformational, and it could well be that some of those are in the construction and technology areas. But there's others that are that are like what we were talking about before in healthcare and energy. They're down payments against future legislation, and in this case, it will be the renewal of the No Child Left Behind law. So mm-hmm. there are there are kind of coercive attachments to the transfers to states which are requiring the state governments to do things that would make a next generation no child left behind more effective in the minds of its theorists. For instance, producing data about which teachers are good and which teachers are not so good, at least uh, correlating teacher performance to student performance, and, and other things like that that are sort of hard to assess on their own. They're, they only make sense if you connect them to a broader reform agenda in No Child Left Behind and in other places. And so it's, it's uh, even my colleagues here at New America who are specialists in education policy, I mean, they certainly understand it better than I do, but even they um, wrestle with the complexity of, of these uh, investments. You know, the, the, the scale in some cases is just breathtaking. Yeah, I think you're right. And the... Um you know, another thing that I, I'm hearing a lot, too, uh, in Elkhart, and, you know, you saw you saw the fight earlier this week in California in Los Angeles where they had to lay off 5,000 teachers, but they were able to save two, use a stimulus to save 2,000 elementary school teachers. Um, the big sort of elephant in the room uh, that, uh, you know, was how much money stimulus money are we getting, when are we getting it, what can it be used for, um, and I think this is, kind of a a big question. Right around this time of year, you're starting to see the deadlines come up with teachers unions of, you know, you need to inform the teacher that they have a job next year, Uh, you know, if their contract's going to continue. 
Right. Uh, you need to start bidding out if you want to get the school construction money, school construction money out, so you can uh, work on school projects before uh, the kids come back into school uh, in September or August, uh, depending on where you live. So I think that's certainly an issue that that's uh, also you know coming up here, just in the you know more short term, not you know Utah transform, transformative, but this is kind of a more short term thing here. Yeah, no, it's an important too, and it goes back to what you were saying about uh, transparency at the beginning, because one way that I've tried to, just at a very superficial kind of intuitive level, judge this com commitment to transparency is to put myself in the position of your teacher's union or some like uh, organization or individual that's in some jeopardy or under pressure because of the economic crisis and who thinks, ah, the stimulus bill maybe as a lifeline, and then they decide, aha, fancy uh, uh, internet thing, I'll go on the web and go to the website of the federal government that holds my potential money and figure out how to proceed, what's going on here. And what's interesting is that each, each of the agencies has a different communications program for just explaining themselves, just for answering the basic question of your teacher's union. What can I expect? What's the formula? How does it affect me? And not surprisingly, as in all areas of government and maybe other places too, the quality of performance in communicating about what's happening, uh, what you need to know, how you can find out about your situation, varies widely across agencies. Some of the sites, websites are really, you know, pretty good being, for being built on the fly in the way they explain things, make information accessible, and some are completely, almost as impenetrable as the bill. This, this is interesting because recovery.gov has been talked about uh, for a long time as the central clearinghouse for this information. And understandably, it takes time. If you want to do, uh, you know, if the government wants to show us every time they spend money, every contract they sign, uh, which is, you know, you talk to OMB Watch or the other transparency organizations, uh, they talk, you know, they, they pretty much agree that this is going to take some time. But right now, if you want to know what's going on in your state, you need to go to you know, drill down four times to DOT's website right. or EPA's website. Right now, you know, you got to go to your EPA region to find out how much money you're getting to clean up uh, Superfund sites in your area, or not Superfund sites, but other aspects the EPA is doing. Um, and you know, you need to go to all the you know. There's 50 different lists right now. If you wanted to add them up and say how much is my state or city getting. Uh, so at ProPublica, this is something that we're trying to track and put together a little bit better and a little bit more centrally right now until, uh, you know, you know, right now. So, you know, one thing that we ha have been doing is keeping track of these weekly reports and adding them up and seeing how much money has already been obligated, how much has been spent is out the door uh, to keep the government accountable. Another thing that we put up there just this week is we got a hold of the, you know, President Obama, one thing they announced this week was the 2000th uh, transportation highway project that has been approved. Um, you know, it's a widening of a road in uh, Portage, Michigan, uh, from four lanes to six. Um, so we went and got the, you know, we were able to obtain this database of all the projects that have been approved and track to see who, you know, who's been, which state has been most successful in securing funding for their projects. Uh, right now, uh, you know, if you go to the website, you can see a chart uh, of how your state's doing in terms of, you know, what percentage has already been secured, how many projects, how much money. So at the top of the list is Oklahoma and Illinois, but there are six states, uh, you know, Florida and Ohio notably, because they have high unemployment rates uh, and have been hit pretty hard by the economic crisis, haven't had any projects uh, approved yet. Uh, so we're seeing sort of, you know, in terms of tracking, uh, what's going on, and seeing how successful this is, you know, in real time, we're seeing pretty wide ranges of, uh, you know, how how this is working. You know, there's a, there's another subject, big structural subject embedded in all of this, uh, which I come across in my cold reading of the bill, and which I really, again, don't understand as well as I would like, but also recognize it would take six months of dedicated effort to get to the level of understanding I would wish. <laughs> But a friend of mine... Well, how long have they been studying the Bible? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> we can have well, yeah, that for a while, right? There were, yeah, there have been sort of 2,000 years of teaching and explanatory uh, discourse about that before plot started, so he's a little bit ahead. But in any event, uh, 
this uh, friend of mine, a uh, former colleague from the Washington Post, a uh, terrific journalist guy named Michael Grunwald, who's now at Time, and who's made a sort of a specialty out of kind of wonky reporting about the way government works and digging into the weeds. When we were at the Post, he did this huge series about the Army Corps of Engineer, which mm -hmm. Engineers, which was really terrific. And in any event, he was saying, uh, apropos of uh, nothing or apropos of the kinds of things that he likes to talk about, that the real um, uh, sort of scandal or the real problem in the stimulus bill or one of the problems that is just taken for granted is that so much of the way the stimulus bill is structured relies on inherited formulas for distribution to the states, and that these, in his view, are sort of flawed, uh, to put it mildly. And I, I, all I can say is that in reading, when at least uh, half, maybe considerably more than that, of the allocations that run through federal departments are channeled through references to past legislation, which in turn contain formulas for state allocations that are completely impenetrable. I mean, you would have no idea whether these allocations conform to common sense or not. So are they census-based? Are they, you know, are they based on some per capita rule? It's, it's completely opaque. I'm sure that the specialists understand it, but uh, if you are trying to rank state performance then, I mean, there is a way that it sounds like your tracking can keep uh, tabs of who's being early and effective relative to their position. But there's a broader question of whether these relative distributions are themselves uh, sensible, or, or were they just convenient because it was the only way that Congress could do something like this so quickly? Yeah, this is this is right on. Um, the Have you gotten to the transportation section yet? I haven't yet, actually, no. Okay. The, tra the transportation, and none of these formulas, or many of these formulas, were not designed for unemployment or for foreclosures or for any of the economic problems we're having now. So transportation is uh, actually really interesting because uh, the money goes out, per, you know, looking at it per capita, states like Wyoming, North Dakota, uh, you know, that have the lowest unemployment rate in the country right now are getting the most, you know, will get the most money per capita. Whereas a state like Michigan or I believe South Carolina, which have you know the highest unemployment rate, are getting very little money per capita when it comes to transportation dollars, and, and why it all is goes that back to these old formulas that were ba are based on uh, how many um, you know federal highway miles you have in your state and how much uh, how, how many miles your people you know your your residents drive each year, uh, not unemployment rate, not um, uh, you know your GDP or anything like that. And, and do you have the impression that during the negotiations about the stimulus bill in Congress that sort of embedded interests in the kind of federal transportation spending political, um, I don't know, political infrastructure in Congress, that they were just immovable on this? Did somebody propose doing it a different way, or was that just too uh, ambitious because you'd have to write all kinds of new formulas that no one could figure out? Too, I, think, I think it was the... You know, the purpose was to get the money out as quickly as possible, uh, and they tried to put together quickly. So they said, let's just rely on these old funding formulas so we don't have these fights that are going to drag out like, you know, like right. molasses and have us here three or four months later trying to debate, you know, highway formulas that are going to affect, you know, federal money for, for decades, you know, for, for years, uh, not decades, for years. Um, so those political fights, though, have happened in the past. Uh, I mean, the last time they tried to uh, change the transportation funding formula, you did see some of that politics play in, and it's it's not necessarily that it was done in the crafting of the stimulus bill, but it's a legacy of, of what we've seen, what we've, what we've had in the past. Right. Well, that seems to be the case in a lot of other areas, too, that they just, you know, they've already had these battles. If you don't, you didn't, in the context of, uh, weeks of negotiations want to reopen uh, those, and it was difficult enough, as it turned out, to to get a, a quick majority organized, even though there seemed to be a broad common sense, economic consensus that a stimulus of this scale was required. If anything, it was a middle ground number that they uh, took, according to the economics textbooks. Nonetheless, the politics got very fractious there at the end, so that probably created a bias to just using old formulas this way. And they tried to – there's a couple places where they did put in, uh, you know, in the transportation section, they put in that, 
you know, this, you know, there should be an effort, and this will be an old law that, that you'll find. Uh, I believe it's a 1968 Transportation Act uh, that they have directed the money, some of the money to go out this way to areas that are most economically distressed. Um, mm. So there is sort of this suggestion in the bill that the money go out that way. Um, but it is, you know, in addition to the formula that we already have. Yeah, I can I actually, can now that you say that, I can recall a couple of other places I've read where the formula referred to, uh, it, it created an emphasis on pre-existing formulas that serve disadvantage over others. There were a couple of places like that where the goal was uh, relief of distressed, disadvantaged uh, people, communities, populations, and so they did do a little tweaking that way. But it does seem like on the main that they just kind of let the politics they had uh, die the, the big big state allocation. Um, so you know, one uh, thing... Tell, tell me about, um, you know, we talked about how you got into this project with, uh, you know, following David David Plotz's, uh logging of the Bible. Why, why the stimulus bill? I mean, tell me about how, you know, how you got into that. Well, it was a very poorly considered decision, actually, kind of a spontaneous uh, Monday morning idea came in. I don't know why. I thought it would be interesting to read the whole bill, so I found it and printed it out and uh, immediately sort of presented itself as this very large and kind of Old Testament document with all these Old English fonts. And and uh, then I just was reminded of... of uh, of Plotz's project, and I, I was going to try to you know, find a post or two in it, a blog post or two in it, but I wasn't planning to read the whole thing, and I sort of made the spontaneous decision to, to try it, and uh, kind of embarked without a lot of uh, not a lot of thought about how much time it was going to take, or whether it would really work. But uh, anyway, it's been it's been a, it's been mixed, it's been fun. Uh, some of it has been. Uh, rewarding in the ways that I hoped, uh, coming across all kinds of little bits and pieces of things that you wouldn't otherwise see or think about. And it's still, what the part that's frustrating is that I just feel like I'm leaving so much on the table. I mean, you know, the reporter in you reads a single paragraph and would wish to just, okay, set that aside, let's work on this for three or four weeks. I simply can't do that. So I have to kind of be more uh, more of an observer and a synthesizer of, of ideas than, than um, you know, that I might ideally like. But it's uh, still, I'm learning a lot. It is a kind of a weird tour of the federal government. There are mm -hmm. lots of surprising uh, corners along the way. And at least it's acquainted me with not so much um, the structure of, uh, you know, the stimulus bill as the structure of the federal government. And, and I'm, you know, it, 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 I, I hope I can stick with some of the subject matter that, you know, the other thing um, about Have you reached it is the climax yet of the, of the stimulus bill? Say again? Have you reached the climax yet of the stimulus bill? <laughs> well, I, well, the thing that worries me is that the first, it's divided into two divisions, as you know, and the right. first division is, is more coherently organized in the sense that it's a lateral tour of federal departments, and you go from place to place, and each time you stop, and, and the stimulus bill is going to do this, and it's going to do the other thing. Uh, there's a second division, which seems to be more complicated, less linear, and I'm a little bit worried about what it's going to entail. But uh, The tax I guess section, I'll, right? The tax section and the yeah. um, entitlement Correct. programs. Correct, exactly. And so I'll, I'll do my best, as they say uh, there, but it may not be quite as uh, easy to sort of travel log um, once, once I reach that, that material. But, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a chance. And one of the things that's really occurred to me, and it, and it uh, only occurred to me after I'd started, but one of my instincts, like your, yours at ProPublica, is that just, you know, all transparency in this environment is probably good transparency, and even if I'm, I'm just kind of uh, skimming and calling attention to things and, and uh, occasionally uh, deconstructing a passage, that, that's, that's good. But one of the uh, realizations that occurred to me as I was underway is that as a percentage of the total national investments in economic recovery, the stimulus bill is oddly, uh, by its nature, the most transparent. So uh, in a way, it kind of takes all of us journalists and we all run to the thing we can do, which is the stimulus bill, because at least it lays out 
uh, section by section and paragraph by paragraph its intent. It may be convoluted. It may have a lot of uh, obscuring detail in it, um, but at least it's there. Now compare that to the uh, TARP, yeah, the where bank. you know basic, yeah, the basic bank uh, troubled assets relief program. I think is what TARP uh, abbreviates. Well, it's now called financial stability. Right. <laughs> yeah. They sort of changed the message with the new administration. Yes, and and you know, so it took weeks and weeks for the um, financial reporters to through and columnists and other sources of pressure to extract an explanation of how money was uh, passed through uh, the rescue of AIG to counterparties uh, that were on the hook for this insurance product at AIG. Uh, used to blow up the global economy. And, you know, just basic information of who got what was very difficult to attract. And there's nothing like the stimulus bill or the or the efforts uh, to make it transparent, to police it, that you can turn to to understand. And those numbers are, in, in the case of the TARP, just as big as the stimulus bill. And in the case of what the Federal Reserve is doing on its own balance sheet, creating all kinds of loan guarantees and, and pouring liquidity into credit markets. Well, there are a lot of private interests in those credit markets. There are a lot of private parties that are benefiting from these approaches to recovery. And as journalists, you know, we just, we don't have a place to begin in most cases. I mean, there's a handful of Federal Reserve reporters who even understand uh, roughly what's going on, but even they can't really get access to, to the detail. So, right, and, and anyway. so much is you know behind the screen, you know, initially of how much, you know, uh, what what are the conditions of how these banks spend the money, and even now it's difficult to find out which banks got the money. Uh, I'm not the reporter who's done uh, the bailout stuff for us, but we also just you know, in addition to this sort of I am the stimulus thing uh, that that I've been doing, somebody else is doing I am the bailout, uh, where hopefully it's a little easier to parse and look quickly and find out if your local bank is getting money and how much money they're getting, uh, it's still a big question of what exactly are they doing with the money because they're not required to do, uh, you know, as much explaining of we're going to do this project and this is why we're doing this project uh, as much as a stimulus bill and the federal agencies and, and state agencies are. Right, because these are proprietary, you know, these this is these are private businesses and they, they claim and argue, and they may be right, I don't know, that this is, you know, competitive proprietary information, but it's, you know, these are taxpayer dollars, so you would think that there would be, uh, and in many cases there's government ownership or at least government leverage, uh, and you would think that the government might want to extract a little more transparency in exchange for its investments. You know, the, the other big um, piece of this that even in comparison to the bank bailouts gets uh, proportionately the least attention but actually involves the greatest sums of national money. They're not really necessarily sums of taxpayer um, money, as I understand it. Now, here I'm stretching my knowledge of economics pretty much to the breaking point. But, you know, the Federal Reserve um, has its own balance sheet, and it, short of printing money, can create credits and liabilities on its own without congressional oversight, without... Uh, by law without presidential interference. So it's it's a kind of extra constitutional economic body in a sense, and it has been creating massive uh, balance sheet liabilities in order to pump money into the economy. And these, uh, as I understand it, are in the you know $2 trillion range. They certainly dwarf the stimulus. And they're not, it's, it, sometimes I guess people say it's like printing money, but it's not literally printing money, it's creating a liability that's offset by an asset, and you hope over time the economy will recover and the Fed will reconcile its books. But it's um, just the fact that we're talking about it this way at this level of abstraction, it shows that it's not even really part of the public discourse about the economic recovery, right. but it's the, it's the biggest sums. And I was at a, a dinner with a couple of people who, who follow this pretty closely, and one of them who wasn't uh, well, maybe, maybe he's an American citizen, I don't know. But he stood up and he made this impassioned speech about how, you know, the American Constitution, at least in a technical sense, is being subverted by this because you have a, a kind of a, 
quasi-independent um, agency that is deliberately set up outside of political control for lots of good reasons, making enormously consequential decisions without any of the normal mechanisms of constitutional oversight. So neither the Congress nor the press, nor even the executive branch, is is being you know sort of held accountable. We don't even really know what's going on. So I don't know. I'm, I'm you know I hope Ben Bernanke is. Uh, I have every reason to think he's he's responsible guy. He's thinking this through. He's trying to do uh, what's best. But I have no idea what he's doing, and I know the numbers are very you know very large. Right, and if, I mean the same thing is sort of happening with a stimulus bill, right? With um, like you mentioned, there's the spending part, and there's the, this sort of tax part that deals with bonds and and sort of these tax credits uh, that are very, you know, I get calls from, um, you know, hedge funds and equity groups saying, can you help us understand the provisions of this, you know, tax provision in the bill? Uh, and they're having a tough time understanding it. And, and right. when you see the press coverage, you're definitely seeing a lot less coverage of the tax portion, mm. which actually makes up slight, you know, $400 billion, right. I believe, or $500 billion, uh, compared to the $350 billion that's going on in the, uh, you know, the spending part. But of course, you know the spending poor. The spending part is a lot more uh, interesting in terms of, you know, uh, I made the joke before that nothing is as concrete as concrete uh, with <laughs> with with highway projects and with uh, infrastructure right. projects. Right. It's something we can see and visibly see uh, right. the change that's going on. So there's a lot of attention being paid to the spending portions, but far less being paid to the tax right. portions. Right, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I I'm. I certainly feel like journalists ought to do what they can do, and and you know if there were a thousand more of us covering the stimulus, then maybe we could could uh, push into some of these areas more effectively. But there is this sort of I have this kind of slightly self-critical sense that you know even in the minor odd idios, idiosyncratic way in which you know a few people like you at ProPublica and others are are working on the stimulus, that there's a you know we're we're running to the light, we're like moths to the flame. Uh, we can cover this. And then you know there's there's this whole other kind of shadow aspect of of economic policy that that may be very consequential that it's even difficult to describe what it is. So, uh, but I, I you know I think there's nothing. Well, and you know the other aspect is there are some you know there are a lot of us reporters coming in the stimulus package, but there's also a lot you know fewer reporters with the resources to go and spend some time on it and to go out to uh, cities across the country that don't have a lot of you know get a lot of attention frequently. And see if this is really working, um, right. you know. So, for example, when you know I was out in Elkhart, I mean, you know, you heard a lot from the laid-off, you know, it's the RV capital of the world. They make all these recreational vehicles there, right? So, I went and spoke to a lot of the laid-off RV workers, and many of them said, you know, gosh, you know, how is this going to, you know, is this really going to help me? I, I worked building cabinets uh, for 32 years uh, for our, you know RVs and motorhomes, you know. I'm a 60-year-old guy. How do you know? How do I or any of my buddies get a road construction job now? Uh, which is where a lot of the money and a lot of the job creation is happening. Right. Um, so that's it's sort of uh, you know something. You know, I think there's a lot of different stories like this that are being untold and you know not being told uh, in communities across the country. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's important, and I also think that there's there is this kind of uh, broad subject of where employment in this country is going, not only the amount of it, but the structure of it and the pace of change and and where are the jobs that the stimulus is creating, where are they in sectors, where are they geographically, are they really responsive to the structure of unemployment and to the acceleration of unemployment. I was, I was about to post something this afternoon, actually, when we finish this in a few minutes, I'll go back and, and finish a little post about a piece of research I came across by some economists at Georgetown who estimated now, you know, it's the, uh, what is it, the dismal science, so I assume it's uh, scientifically approximate. I don't know how accurate it is, but they estimated that the stimulus uh, will create 3.7 million jobs, of which slightly more than half require some uh, college education. And in their research, um, there are even 14,000, 15,000 jobs that require a postdoctoral degree. The number of jobs that are available for unskilled workers um, is relatively small. Now, I guess that partly this reflects the structure of employment and generally and how it's been changing. Generally, um, new jo the, the sectors 
where jobs are growing have required more education. But it's also built into the bias of the stimulus as policy choices. So some of the big job-creating investments are in um, next-generation technologies that require yeah. advanced degrees. So is that really responsive to the to the crisis that communities like Eckerd and others are actually experiencing? As is it as responsive as it, as it should be as it could be? I think those are fair questions. Well, yeah, yeah, the green technology jobs, and there's you know there's money for doctor training, nursing nursing training, uh, un- university uh, science labs. Um, uh, you know, I think you mentioned in a post recently about all the money going to uh, to health research with uh, vaccines and diseases. Uh, you know, and Bobby Jindal made the point about volcano monitoring. You know, is this something? You know, he he sort of made the point in jest, but then we saw you know a volcano erupt in Alaska, um, right. and you know, so there's stimulus money that's going to create jobs for volcanologists. Um, right. uh, you know, on the you know, you said you mentioned the half. Um, you know, about ha- half of those 3.5 million jobs uh, are supposed to be created with this road construction money. But one thing that's key when we talk about job numbers too is to realize that these are these economic theories about multipliers. Uh, just so right. you know, the audience understands, right. uh, multipliers uh, are basically the idea if if you hire, uh, you know, if we if we put money into a bridge and we hire a construction worker, we all see that. We kind of see the guy who makes the steel and the concrete and supplies that getting a job. Uh, but there's also this this idea that, you know, when the um, uh, construction worker comes home and he's got extra money to take his family out to dinner, we've now created a job for a cook and a waitress uh, when you add it up enough. Right. So these 3.5 million jobs aren't going to be 3.5 million people that we can stand up in a line uh, and count very accurately. It's going to be something, you know, that probably will be based on economic models when we say, did this work? Did we really create this many jobs? Right, and and then the the pace of uh, destruction of employment because of uh, contracting um, economic activity is itself dynamic. So, you, you, who knows what what kind of natural employment destruction or creation will be occurring over the eighteen month period that the stimulus will play out? I mean, I think that you know you can't really, in fairness, hold uh, the stimulus to account at that level of precision. My sense, though, is that whether there are, um, you know, there, there is this this bias toward investments in kind of transformational projects and in science and in uh, clean energy and, and, you know, things that personally I believe the country should be investing in. But I also um, recognize, as, as you're reporting, highlights that the politics, the democratic impetus for this bill was relief for communities and and uh, people who are in distress as a result of this extraordinary uh, and deepening economic contraction. So if by looking over the horizon uh, you you don't reach the the actual communities that are uh, being devastated by this crisis, then even if you do make successful down payments in some cases, have you really done what what uh, the people who elected you wanted you to do? So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it couldn't couldn't be more complicated. I, I, you know, we've been talking now for almost fifty minutes. When I when I started on this, I my uh, colleague said they want you to talk for forty five minutes or an hour. I I was very skeptical that there was forty five minutes of conversation <laughs> available here, <laughs> but in fact. Uh, there has been, and I really in, enjoyed it, and uh, and I'm stimulated now to to follow your um, your work that much more carefully. And uh, uh, so, you know, Godspeed, get out there <laughs> and uh, uh, have fun because it's uh, it's just an endlessly uh, ripe subject for for journalism, investigative journalism. Uh, I envy I envy you your assignment. It's a it's a terrific assignment. Well, thanks, and, and um, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to when I sort of started out. I had, you know, I read the bill really, really quickly, so I'm interested to see sort of what you know buried gems uh, you're going to dig up uh, and tell us about. Well, send uh, you know all, uh, all all clues and comments are welcome, so send them send them my way. Um, but uh, okay, thanks again. Uh, take care. I hope we'll we'll talk again sometime. Thank you.